what the story, the Harry Potter story says is that if you are fighting a dragon, a snake, something terrible, something that will paralyze you if you look at it and you are doing that in order to redeem something, that, redeem something from that encounter because you often learn things when you do something that you are afraid of, in fact almost all learning occurs in spite of fear, right, because to, to learn something you have to explore something new and that's usually something that's frightening and so what that means is that if you're willing to face something that's frightening you can garner something of value now it also, meet, it also may well mean in the context of that story and you see this in the romance that underlies the first part of Harry Potter is that you know the, the man who's capable of standing up to predatory reptiles is also the one who is most likely to attract women and I think that that's been a truth since God only knows when too, I mean we have no idea but human beings are definitely hunters right, and men are bigger than women and one of the things that that suggests is that you know, a lot of the predatory like activities that are characteristic of human beings were undertaken by males and some usually males that hunt, but anyways we can, we can put all that, we can put all that aside Harry gets bitten by this basilisk, and part of the reason that the story shows that is because it wants to tell you, the story wants to tell you, so to speak, that the danger that you face when you voluntarily confront something you're afraid of in order to learn is actually a danger. It's real. You see an example like that too in the Avengers. Um, I don't remember the guy's name. He's the black guy with the patch over his eye. Who is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know that 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 uh, the representation of the of the one-eyed hero is also quite common. And you see this, for example, in ancient Egyptian mythology. There's a god named Horus, who I'll talk to you about. In fact, I'm going to. Sh there's a picture of Horus actually. Horus is the god on the left there on the on the picture of the left. He's got a face like a uh, like a falcon, and that's because falcons can see. And the reason the Egyptians turned Horus into a falcon is because Horus is the eye. You've seen all seen the famous Egyptian eye. Horus can see. One of the things he sees is evil, and that actually he has an encounter with evil, and as a consequence, one of his eyes gets torn out. And the idea there is that, you know, you have to face evil, just like you have to confront fear. And fear can paralyze you, and, and the things that make you afraid can kill you. And in a confrontation with evil, the same thing can happen: is that it can be so overpowering and traumatic that it damages your consciousness. And like these things are these things are real. They're real. I mean that that happened to uh, what's the general's name, uh, the Canadian general who was there during the Rwandan massacre. Um, he developed post-traumatic stress disorder, and he entitled the book he wrote about the development of his post-traumatic stress disorder was called "Shake Hands with the Devil," and that's really what he meant because he he met one of the guys who led the massacre, you know, and anyways, he never really recovered from that, he has post-traumatic stress disorder and so, these things are extraordinarily real now, back to the basilisk well, if you're going to confront something that's dangerous enough and informative enough to, to like virtually kill you and you're going to survive, what does that mean? it means that your capacity for death and renewal is what saves you and so, you know, you think, you think about this, partly what it means is that like, there you are, but you learn something ok, well, once you learn something, you're not the same as you were before you learned it, right? there's a transformation so that means you're the same as you are, because you're still there, but you're also different and then you might also ask yourself, well, what do you give up when you learn something? and that's an interesting question, because you very seldom learn something that's completely without precedent now if you do, that's really shocking generally, but you generally don't what happens is, is that you already have a framework of evaluation that you're using to interpret the world and it, you know, it's good enough to get you from place to place, but it's not 100% accurate and when you encounter something you didn't expect, or something that's frightening so that you have to transform your knowledge, generally what happens is you have to lose some of what you already presume before you can learn something new, you know, it's like a, a prejudice or an oversimplification or an element of your ignorance has to be allowed to die before you can incorporate the information and then grow and so you might say, well death is the precondition for learning at least symbolically speaking, and that's exactly what the phoenix is attempting to represent in the Harry Potter story, now who owns the phoenix? Dumbledore, right, and he's sort of god of Hogwarts, so to speak, you know, so so the, the phoenix stands in the same relationship to 
Dumbledore that Christ stands in relationship to God the Father in Christianity It's exactly the same kind of idea Well, it's not exactly the same, obviously But the underlying structure of the idea is very similar and If you remember, maybe What happens to Harry Potter at the very end of the, of the series? What, what, what process does he have to go through? He dies, right? And then he comes back to life right? And he has to die and come back to life in order to defeat evil it's pretty funny because you know a lot of people, especially fundamentalists in the U.S., were all over Harry Potter for its hypothetically anti-Christian occultism. But you know the fundamental story. I wouldn't say it's Christian exactly because it's actually older than Christianity itself. But the main themes in Harry Potter are like Christian symbolism informs the main themes to a great degree. You know, and it's funny because most of the time when you go see this sort of thing, how many of you watched all the Harry Potter movies? Yeah, like what the hell's up with that, you know? This woman got people reading 700 page books and when they were 10 years old I, I suspect a lot of you were those people You know, so why were you so interested in that stuff? For God's sake, it's about a magic orphan What's wrong with you people, you know? <laughs> magic orphans? You know, but for some reason, why an orphan? Well, Superman's an orphan too And if you go on Wikipedia It's kind of an interesting thing to do Look up superhero orphans It's like 500 of them you know, and it's, that's a very comp, it goes along, it also goes along with the idea of having two sets of parents Which is also characteristic both of Superman and of Harry Potter, right? Because Harry has his daily, day-to-day, -day, you know, parents that aren't his real parents And then he has his heavenly parents who are his magic parents And, you know, this representation here that I've got up in front of you And I, I was telling you a little bit about that in the last lecture you can say, in some sense, those are representations of your magic parents And so you can think about it this way It's like, you have a mother and a father And those are your local mothers and fathers And whether or not you get along with them, or whether or not they were any good for you Or whether you understand them, or anything like that In some sense is irrelevant, because they're not your real parents Your real parents are something more like nature, biology, the unknown, something like that And culture we kind of think of that as nature and nurture, you know, which is also a symbolic idea And so one of the things that Jung thought, Freud thought, you couldn't be a man until your father died It's kind of an interesting idea And Jung said, yeah, but the death could be symbolic And partly what he meant by that was that, you know, insofar as you're still the son of your father Or the daughter of your father, or the son of your mother, or the daughter of your mother You still haven't grown up You haven't taken the projections those would be Freudian projections that make you subordinate to your parents Because you might ask yourself, why the hell do you care what your parents think? You don't care what any random set of 50, 60 year old people think about you Why do you care what your parents think? Well, the reason for that, I would say, is because you're, you're suffering or benefiting as a consequence of a projection You project something onto your parents It's like a quasi-deity status And they're the people who know what's going on And they're... You know, they're entitled to evaluate you And maybe you're working to achieve things to impress them and make them happy It's like, well, why them? Why them? You don't care what their, your parents' friends think, I don't imagine You probably don't really care what the parents of your friends think So why do you care what your parents think? Well, understanding that is part of coming to understand the dynamics Freud would say of the personal unconscious Because your relationship with your parents is part of your personal unconscious and Jung's idea was, well, you have to replace It's interesting, because Freud thought that the reason there were patriarchal religions was because people projected the figure of their father onto the cosmos in some sense They sort of personified the cosmos You know, it's like God is an old man with a beard Which, by the way, isn't as stupid a theory as it sounds like But anyways, um, so, you know, Freud thought that religion sort of emerged out of the familial dynamic but Jung thought that that wasn't exactly right Because the religious symbols, like say the one on the right there Where you have God the Father Was representing something like a meta-father You know, the sum total of all fathers Which would be something like the patriarchy And you need a representation of that Because you are a child of culture And if you're not a child of culture Then you're an incomplete being And you also don't want to confuse your parents Or your father, let's say I mean, there's masculine and feminine elements in both parents But for the sake of simplification, I'm going to lay it out the way I am laying it out You don't want to confuse your father with culture or history He's the embodiment of both those things, but he certainly doesn't embody it in total 
And your primary relationship, in some sense, your personal relationship is to your father, but your primary existential relationship is actually to culture itself. 